once uh, you know once they become real sick and they need their sinus node to, to pick up to, to maintain their blood pressure and things like that, they, they, they all of a sudden you know really tank. So you know it, it brings out the best in arrhythmias when people are in the ICU. And there's also just a lot of crossover, as you know, between the MICU and the CCU. You know, sometimes the, the lines are blurred between you know you're treating patients with you know acute MIs that have other issues requiring them to be in the MICU or vice versa. So it's it's just good to know a lot of the uh, you know the kind of intensive cardiac issues that uh, these patients are going to have. So what I'll be talking about here is. Um, both the diagnosis and the management um, of the most common types of arrhythmias that you encounter. Obviously, you don't get anywhere if you can't diagnose what the problem is, and, and obviously it doesn't help to know what the problem is if you don't know what to do about it. So we'll, we'll be covering both of those things today. So when you talk about EP issues, there's pretty much only three things that we deal with. Our, our entire field is really just one of three things. We deal with tachyarrhythmias, we deal with bradyarrhythmias, and we deal with device problems, people that have pacemakers and defibrillators, and that's pretty much the entirety of what we do for a living. So what we'll be doing is breaking down the talk into these three parts, and um, the bulk of it is going to be on tachyarrhythmias, both because that's probably the majority of what you're going to see, and it's also generally what makes people kind of the most nervous or the most unsure. So my main goal is to make you more comfortable with some of these things that you might have previously been not so comfortable with. So let's start talking about tachyarrhythmias. So here's a nice example. This is a young guy who, uh, who I saw when I was a fellow. Um, young, healthy guy. And he comes in with some palpitations and just some kind of chest discomfort. And he comes in with this EKG. So... Obviously, this is a pretty crazy-looking EKG, right? I don't think anyone will disagree with that. Does anyone want to kind of describe what you see here? Just give me a give me a general description. I'm not even asking for a definitive diagnosis. We can just start with the basics. So this is a tachycardia, right? It's going fast. We all agree with that. And how do we describe our tachycardias? Wide or narrow? Okay, so this is a wide, complex tachycardia. All right, so, you know, we don't need to go too, too much in depth just now. I mean, needless to say, this is a pretty crazy-looking EKG. So what I would like to do is give you some tips on what to do when you are handed a crazy-looking EKG like this, especially if it's in the middle of the night. Well, first of all, just look at the patient. Okay, if, if uh, look at the clinical scenario. So if you have a patient in wide complex tachycardia, your first job is just look at, look, at, look at the individual. Are they unstable or are they stable? Okay, if they're unstable, meaning if they're real hypotensive or they're uh, having crushing chest pain or they can't breathe or their eyes are rolling in the back of their head, that's, that's easy. All you have to do is shock them. Shock first and ask questions later. If they're stable, and in the case of this patient, he was stable. You know, he was saying, yeah, my heart is racing. What's going on? I'm, well, he was breathing. His sats were fine. His blood pressure was not too bad. Well, if they're stable, you don't want to rush for the paddles. You want to just sit down and, and try to dis, uh, decipher what, what we're dealing with so we can treat it more, more directly. So when we have someone with <coughs> a tachyarrhythmia like this, what I like to do is try to make things as simple as possible for you. You know, it's the middle of the night, you've got a million things you're doing, and you're handed a crazy looking EKG. You know, you don't want to make things complicated. Let's make it as simple as possible. So whenever you're handed a tachyarrhythmia, all you have to do is answer two simple questions about that ECG. Is it wide or narrow? And is it regular or irregular? All right, I think we all agree those are simple questions that anyone can answer, right? And, and just by answering those two simple questions about the ECG, you're going to dramatically reduce the differential diagnosis of what you're dealing with. And you'll be able to compartmentalize what is the mechanism of this tachycardia. So let's talk about it. So we've got a little diagram here of our uh, different, uh, different uh, qualities, wide, narrow, regular, irregular. Let's start with narrow, complex, and regular tachycardias. So let's start there. So what... Name, name some narrow, complex, regular tachycardias out there. So, I heard some murmurs. SVT. Okay, so SVT, okay. 
and um, there's a few different types of SVT. And we don't need to get into all the details, but there's like AVNRT, atrial tachycardia, um, AVRT using accessory pathways, but you know broadly lumped as SVT. Any other uh, examples of a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia? Okay, sinus tachycardia obviously would fit in there. There's one other common one that you might see. Yeah, exactly. So flutter, if it has regular conduction, okay, that's going to be a narrow, complex, regular tachycardia, and that's basically it. So you got your sinus, you got your flutter. And then these are your different uh, different mechanisms that are broadly lumped into the SVT category. Okay, so let's talk about narrow, complex, irregular tachycardias. What do you got there? Atrial fibrillation. I heard someone say. Anything else? Okay, so MAT is a good example. That's something that you know a lot of pulmonologists are going to see because that obviously is known to be well associated with, you know, advanced COPD and things like that, so. And also, you've got atrial flutter lumped in there if there's variable AV conduction. So the atrial flutter is irregularly conducting into the ventricle. So if you've got a narrow complex, irregular tachycardia, it's one of these three things, okay? Now let's talk about wide complex regular tachycardia. So it's a wide complex regular tachycardia. Mm -hmm. VT, very good, that's the easy one, all right? Wide complex regular is VT. What's the other one that we're always kind of trying to decipher VT against is? Okay, so yeah, so SVT with aberrancy, right? And what we mean by SVT with aberrancy specifically is SVT, what, is a, what do we mean by aberrancy? Just a bundle branch block, that's all it means. It means the, the ventricle is being conducted abnormally or slowly and that just means if they've got an SVT but there's a bundle branch meaning a left bundle or a right bundle it's going to make the QRS wide so we're just going to take these and it's going to be wide and so we're just going to shift them over here which is in the setting of a bundle branch block and the other example there's one rare example which I can pretty much assure you you'll be lucky if you see it once in your career um, is antidromic AVRT. This is using an accessory pathway, but going down the accessory pathway. So basically WPW, but you know, you're, you're, you're pretty safely going to not see this very commonly. But that's it, okay? VT, SVT with aberrancy, or, or this rare one. And how about an irregular wide complex tachycardia? <laughs> so a lot of it is kind of the same thing we're talking about here. If you just take the narrow complex irregular tachycardias and you just give them something to make it wide, okay, so aberrancy, so you're going to have atrial fibrillation, okay, with aberrancy, meaning a bundle, or a pre-excited AV conduction, that's basically WPW in the setting of atrial <coughs> fibrillation, so they've got those delta waves from pre-excitation making it wide, okay, and and so we've, we, if we just kind of keep this in mind, right, we're answering simple questions, wide or narrow, regular or irregular, but now we can compartmentalize things and say, all right, I have no idea what this tracing is, but I know it's <laughs> wide or narrow, I know it's regular or irregular. I can kind of say, all right, I kind of have a bearing as to what we're dealing with. So let's go back to his tracing. And now that we're armed with this type of, uh, of a uh, approach, Let's answer those questions. Is this wide or narrow? We've already established this wide. How about regular or irregular? What do you guys think? Slightly irregular. Yeah, slightly irregular. And if it's slightly irregular, that's good enough to call it irregular. Like when we say regular, we mean it's like dead-on regular. And this definitely is not. If you look at like, you know, these two complexes are kind of close together. You know, these are a little farther apart, that's a little farther apart, these are a little closer. You can see it's, it's kind of irregular, right? So it's irregular. So this is a wide, complex, irregular tachycardia, okay? And so going back to what we're dealing with, what is it? Atrial fibrillation with aberrant, or in this case, it was pre-excited AV conduction. This was a kid that had WPW, and he went into atrial fibrillation. That's what it looks like. So this is a good example of someone that came in with a crazy-looking EKG, 
And just by answering those simple questions, we could nail down, okay, this guy has pre-excited atrial fibrillation. We're done. We've got our diagnosis. So keep these things in mind. So let's just talk a little bit more in detail about, what, you know, wide complexes. And, you know, I like to think anatomically about what causes the wide complex. It's great to, when you're thinking about mechanisms of tachycardia, just think about the anatomy. So this is the uh, electrical system. Sinus node in the atria going through the AV node, through your his Purkinje system, right? And going out to the ventricle. So whenever you have a narrow QRS, that means you're rapidly conducting electricity through the ventricles. That means con um, electrical conduction is through the only thing that travels fast in your, in your ventricles, which is the his Purkinje system. So if you've got a narrow QRS, it means you're going through the his Purkinje. So on the, on the, the converse of that, is that if you've got a wide complex, it means the ventricles are conducting electricity through means outside of the his Purkinje system. Okay, and what does that mean? So VT is an example. So you've got just some spot that's firing off or some circuit that's firing off from the ventricle. It's traveling not through the his Purkinje system, but through just the ventricular myocardium, which conducts electricity slowly. So that's why your complex is wide. You could have an accessory pathway like we talked about. So you've got... You know, the accessory pathway conducts from the atrium to the ventricle, but it inserts into the myocardium. It doesn't insert into the his Purkinje system. So all that ventricle is being activated through the slow myocardial channel. So that's why you're wide in that case. Or you've got a bundle branch block. So let's say your bundle isn't working. In this case, this would be a right bundle branch block. And your left bundle, therefore, is conducting, and the left ventricle is conducting quickly. But your right ventricle, which is supplied by the right bundle, is not. All that right ventricle is coming through the myocardial channel slowly to the right ventricle. So a bundle branch block gives you a wide complex for that reason. So if you see a wide complex, just think anatomically, and you can make that correlation. That's what's going on inside this guy's heart. So again, in his case, we were talking about atrial fibrillation, and it was wide because it was pre-excited. Those were all delta waves there that you were seeing that was making it wide. All right, so here's another example. 72-year-old woman with coronary artery disease. So let's, uh, I don't know what this is, so let's just answer those simple questions and go from there. Any, any thoughts? Well, let's, let's start with... Uh, it's wide complex, and it's regular, okay? So, wide complex, all right, so what's our differential? It's, uh, it's going to be here, okay? So as one, one person pointed out, it could be VT, or it could be SVT with aberrancy, or antidromic AVRT, okay? It could be any of those things. So we have to kind of further sort this one out. We've got a little bit more work to do. So again, let's ask some, uh, some other uh, easy questions, okay? If we're not sure about wide complex regular tachycardia, let's just ask, does this patient have a history of an MI or a cardiomyopathy or some kind of heart problem in their past? Well, if they do, that strongly favors VT. And in fact, there have been studies that have looked at wide complex tachycardias and the predictive value of the patient just having a history of MI. And... If you have a, a wide complex tachycardia in a patient that has a history of MI or some other major structural heart disease, if you don't even look at the ECG and you just say that's VT, do you know how? Do you know what the chance is that you'll be correct? It's about 95 to 97 percent. Okay. So, without I'm not telling you not to look at the EKG. You should definitely look at the EKG. But. Um, if they have a history of some kind of heart problem and they come in with a wide complex regular tachycardia, the odds are already strongly going to be in favor of VT. And then if you happen to see some other things like AV dissociation, and those things can be kind of tricky to see, but again, those types of things also strongly favor VT, okay? So these are two quick and easy things to, to use to say if, if it's VT or if it's, say, SVT with aberrancy. But what about all those other criteria? So, you know, some of you guys may remember learning, you know, either as med students or as uh, residents or whatever, 
you know, there are all these other diagnostic criteria that we use. You guys have heard of like Brugada criteria and all of those types of things. Like how do you de determine a VT versus an SVT with a barency? And here are some exact, you know, here are some examples of. So all you have to do is just memorize all this stuff, and you'll be fine. It's not so easy, right? This is this is. You know, I, I remember when I was a resident, I, I memorized all this stuff, and uh, I would I would know it for about a day or two, and then. I would completely forget it, and I have to relearn it all over again. This is this is all, you know, kind of mumbo jumbo. It's 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 valid, but how can you possibly memorize this stuff? Well, if you don't memorize this stuff, all you need to really do is understand what what are they getting at here? What is what does all this mean? What is the what is the underlying thought process of all these findings? And it's very, actually very simple. Does the QRS look like a typical right bundle or a left bundle, or does it look funny? That's all these things are saying. So the idea is that if you've got a right bundle branch block or a left bundle branch block, your ventricular activation should follow a fairly predictable pattern, right? You've got a block in the right bundle going down the left bundle. It's all kind of predictable. And so a right bundle branch block should have some standard appearance to it. Conversely, a left bundle should have some kind of standard appearance to it. And these are just ways of quantifying those standards. And it's a way of just objectively measuring and saying, does this have the characteristics that a right bundle or a left bundle should have? And if it does, then it probably is a right bundle or a left bundle. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't follow those rules, then it's probably VT. Okay? And so let's, let's use this knowledge now in terms of this, uh, in the, in this tracing. So first of all, she has CAD. Okay, so already right off the bat, we're saying this, this could very well be, um, this very well could be VT. And now let's, uh, let's apply the, the, the notion of right bundle or left bundle. So whenever we look at a, at a, at a VT, we, we classify it as a right bundle or left bundle morphology meaning we look at V1, and if it's positive, we say it's a right bundle morphology, and if it's negative, it's a left bundle morphology. Not to say it's a right bundle or a left bundle, but just what the general shape is. So this is what? This is positive in V1, so this is a right bundle morphology, right? So now we're going to say, does this look like a right bundle should, or does it not? Well, how does a right bundle branch normally look in V1? What's the typical pattern? Exactly, right? It's an RSR prime. You've got a nice sharp R wave. You've got a sharp S wave. And you've got a big R prime. You know, the, the rabbit ears that they talk about. That's how a right bundle should look, okay? Does this look like a right bundle should look? Does this show that RSR prime? Okay, no, not at all. This is just a big, fat R wave. That's not an RSR prime at all, okay? So we're saying that this is a right bundle, but it really, it's a right bundle pattern because it's positive in V1, but it does not look anything like a right bundle should. And therefore, it's not a right bundle, it's VT. Okay, and that's the way that we're confirming that this is definitely VT. Okay, and we've made our diagnosis. All right, so great. We've made our diagnosis of VT. We can walk away and go home and be proud of ourselves, right? Okay. Not exactly. We've got to actually deal with it. Um, and so now we're getting kind of more into the management of, of what to do with these patients. So again, let's go to the basic questions. This patient's in VT. Are they unstable, hypotensive, chest pain, etc.? Shock them. That's it. Ask questions later. If they're stable, you can consider medical management for VT. You know, and it's not that unusual to see a person in VT who's awake, alert, mentating, might be a little uncomfortable, but they're perfusing. And you can, you know, they're not going to want you to shock them, you know, while they're awake. They're not going to like that. So you can consider just treating these folks medically. And what you can use, well, there's a few different drugs. Obviously, amiodarone is, is the go-to drug in the emergency room and in many other settings. But, you know, there are a couple of other drugs out there. Prokinamide is a real common one that's been around forever. You can give that intravenously. Lidocaine is another example. And I'm just, I, you know, just telling you there are other drugs out there other than amiodarone. 
And what do these drugs do? Well, procainamide is a class 1 drug. We don't need to get into too much of the nitty-gritty, but class 1 drugs block sodium channels. That's what they do. So they slow depolarization and they slow conduction, and that's the way they terminate rhythms. Lidocaine is also a class 1, uh, so it also blocks, uh, blocks uh, sodium channels. And the one circumstance where you might really want to think about lidocaine is for someone with ischemia going on. So you should kind of mentally equate lidocaine with ischemia. And the reason is that lidocaine binds sodium channels specifically in their inactive or depolarized state. And what happens is when tissue is ischemic, it stays in this state longer. So lidocaine actually preferentially binds to ischemic tissue. And so... Um, if you have a patient that's having arrhythmia problems, VT or something like that, and you think they have ischemic disease, lidocaine's a good, a good idea of something that you might want to try. What's the main thing that you look for with lidocaine in terms of what do you have to follow clinically or toxic, you know, toxicity-wise? Do you guys remember what the issue is, the main? So it's neurologic toxicity. So people can get like seizures, paresthesias, mental status changes, things like that. So lidocaine, if you have someone on a lido infusion, those are the types of things that you want to look for there. So, but it's a great drug if you've got someone with active ischemia that's, uh, that their uh, arrhythmias are acting up. All right, so let's quickly talk about our narrow complex tachycardias and our regular ones. So these are your SVTs and whatnot. And here's an example of an SVT, and here's an EKG of someone going in sinus rhythm, you can see, and then all of a sudden, bam, off to the races, right? And this is pretty clearly a narrow complex regular tachycardia. So this is, this is SVT. So first of all, what do you do if someone goes into SVT? Vagal maneuvers are real quick and easy and, and pretty harmless. They usually don't work, but occasionally you'll get lucky, and it will, and it really doesn't hurt to try. But if not, then use adenosine, and adenosine is definitely your friend. Uh, you know, Dr. Rivers and I were talking, we had a nice case in the ED about a month or two ago, and we had someone that came in with a, an incessant narrow complex tachycardia, and it required kind of a superhuman dose of adenosine, but we actually got it under control, and, and uh, the patient did real well. So um, adenosine, what does adenosine do? It blocks the AV node, and therefore it will terminate any arrhythmia that is dependent on the AV node. And that is, that's, uh, you know, uh, rhythms like AVNRT or AVRT, those rhythms depend on the AV node to work for the, for the rhythm to perpetuate. So if you block the AV node, even for one beat, the whole rhythm terminates. And you can also terminate atrial tachycardia, so irritable foci in the atrium. If you give them adenosine, about a third to a half of these will actually respond to adenosine. And for others, it can actually help with diagnosis. You give some AV block and you can see the rhythm. If you say atrial flutter, it'll help bring out the flutter waves when you block the AV node. So give adenosine, and if you don't get a, a response, try to just give a little bit more. You know, start with six, give it as a real, you know, push it really hard in. If it doesn't work, go to 12, and you may even need to go more, as the case that we had uh, not, not too long ago in the ED. I always, I always kind of warn people, be real careful if, you're, if you have any kind of concern for ischemia to give adenosine, um, especially if it's a wide complex tachycardia. I know a lot of the algorithms kind of go to giving adenosine, you know, regardless if it's a wide complex, give them adenosine. But you want to be real careful with this. And, and you know, the reason is, say someone's ischemic, you know, what else, you know, say they're in an ischemic VT, well, what else do you use adenosine for? It's used as a stress test agent, right? So if someone's coming in with an MI and VT, is that, is that a good time to give them a stress test? You know, probably not, right? So if you have any kind of concern for ischemia, if you give them adenosine, they really can decompensate, and that does happen. So you want to be real careful about that. But for a narrow complex rhythm, you should, you should pretty much go for it. So let's uh, quickly talk about atrial fibrillation because this is, you know, really probably the bulk of what you guys are going to be seeing in the ICU. Um, it's the most common sustained arrhythmia in, in adults and humans, and it's even more common in the ICU. And that's because it's often 
triggered by acute illness. So someone is septic or say they have respiratory distress or COPD or pneumonia. Also, if they're you know, bleeding or something like that, any kind of stress will often trigger atrial fibrillation. And you can have patients with well-controlled AFib or no history of AFib, and all of a sudden they have some kind of acute illness, and, and it becomes a huge problem that you're having a hard time controlling. So first of all, the management of atrial fibrillation in the ICU, you kind of start from a place that's very similar to the management in anyone with atrial fibrillation in the outpatient clinic or in any other setting. And there's really three hallmarks of the management of atrial fibrillation. And every time you have a patient with AFib, you want to think of three things about what to do for this patient. Number one, rate control. Obviously, they usually are going to be tachycardic, and so you want to make sure that you control the rate. Number two, you want to consider anticoagulation for stroke prevention, and that's that's based on their risk of stroke and also what's their uh, what are their other what are their other issues. Obviously, if they're in AFib and they're coming in with a massive GI bleed or something like that, that's probably not the best time to anticoagulate. But you always want to consider: is this someone I should be anticoagulating? And then finally, and this is often where we kind of come in, you know, and where the where the EP consults come in is uh, rhythm control. What should we do? Should we try to control the rhythm? Should we cardiovert them? Should we give them drugs? Should we just let them be in atrial fibrillation? You know, there's all of the above are possibilities, and that's where, that's where it gets really kind of tricky, and oftentimes, like I said, that's where we kind of get involved in these cases. So AFib, you know, even though it happens everywhere, it's more challenging often in IC patients, and that's because these patients are almost invariably adrenergically stimulated for some reason. You know, either they're septic and that's a real hyperadrenergic state or maybe they're, uh, you know, hypotensive, they're bleeding, you know, something like that. These patients, you know, almost across the board ha are kind of in a hyperadrenergic state and that's going to, you know, that's going to rev up the rate of your atrial fibrillation. So the most important thing when you have these patients that are going tachycardic is treat the underlying illness first and foremost. You know, you can kind of think of fast atrial fibrillation, you know, in a critically ill patient, a critically Ill patient think of it almost analogously to sinus tachycardia. You know, let's say you have someone that's septic or they're having a massive GI bleed, so they're hypotensive, and the natural response is sinus tachycardia. Well, are you going to want to treat the sinus tachycardia by slamming that person with beta blockers? No. The, the way that you treat that sinus tachycardia, first and foremost, is, you know, resuscitate the patient with fluid or blood. You know, get their pressure up. Make the sinus node a little bit calmer. Okay? And that's the way you treat it. And so if you've got someone with AFib and rapid rates, the first and foremost thing is don't just rush to think, I've got rapid AFib. I've got to hit them with beta blockers. You got to first treat the underlying illness. Are they hypotensive from their sepsis, from their uh, GI bleed, or whatever it is, and, and treat those things first. And you may be able to control the rate that way. If you can, great. If you can't, then we can start talking about other other ways to control the rate. And those are the same types of things that you treat them in any other setting. You give them, you know, beta blockers like metoprolol is obviously the most common. Esmolol can be very handy in these. You know, acute patients because it's real short acting, so you can give them a trial, and if it doesn't work out or if it tanks their pressure, you can turn it off and get it out of their system real quickly. You can try calcium channel blockers. Diltiazem is the most common. You can use digoxin. Um, typically, it does not work very well, particularly in critically ill patients. And the reason, do you know why? You know what digoxin does to control the rate? Do you know the mechanism? So it's actually, it's a vagomimetic drug. It actually enhances vagal tone is the way that uh, digoxin can control AFib. Well, if you think in the ICU setting in particular, these are patients that aren't going to have a lot of vagal tone. They're sick. They're, we just said, they're adrenergic. Their, their parasympathetic system is kind of withdrawn. And so digoxin's not going to usually get you very far. There's some data that if you use it in conjunction with a beta blocker to to curb that uh, sympathetic drive that you could get some mileage out of digoxin. But generally, it's it's kind of a later or a last-line agent. People always ask about amiodarone as well. That comes up as a question. Should you give amiodarone for rate control? Again, it's kind of a la later-line agent, but sometimes that can be useful as well if you're really unable to do it through the standard measures.
What about anticoagulation? Um, so if, they, if you're sure they never had atrial fibrillation and it's relatively short acting, you can consider holding anticoagulation and just doing a cardioversion or something like that. So someone has never had AFib, they're in the ICU, all of a sudden they go into AFib and you're confident that they've never had it before. You can safely assume if it's a short term thing that you know you can just shock them and that a, a blood clot hasn't formed. Um, but you know they, um, you know, you want to be confident about that. And obviously, if you do need to anticoagulate them, you're going to use heparin and alovinox in the acute setting. Um, but again, a lot of these patients have coagulopathies, and you're going to want to be careful about that, or GI bleeds, or things like that. Um, to cardiovert someone, real easy to do. You just uh, you know give them a DC shock. It has to be synchronized. Always uh, make sure that you know before you press the button that it is synchronized with the QRS. Otherwise, you run the risk of potentially shocking at the wrong part of the uh, QRS or the T wave, and you can actually cause them to go into VF, which is not a good outcome for, for cardioversions. Um, you know, anywhere 200 to 360 joules is fine. And then you can give drugs like amurin. It's obviously the most common in the acute setting. We often will give drugs like sotalol or dofetilide. Those work very well, um, oftentimes as well, when they're given in the right setting. But generally, um, I think you're probably going to want us on board to give these types of drugs. They, they require a little bit more monitoring in terms of the QT interval and things like that. Okay, that's the bulk of our talk for tachyarrhythmias. Now let's just talk a little bit about bradyarrhythmias and device problems to round things out. So, for bradyarrhythmias, well, there are two types, okay? So if someone is bradycardic, it's for one of two reasons, okay? Either the sinus node ain't working or the AV node ain't working. Okay, that's it. So, if someone's bradycardic, that's one of those two possibilities. The sinus node is relatively simple. There's just one way in which the sinus node doesn't work is the sinus node just doesn't work. AV block is a little bit more tricky because there are different ways that the AV node can block. You know, first of all, you can have things like vagal tone. Okay, that's where you see things like wanky bach, right? And that typically is a fairly benign finding. If it's something involving vagal tone, that's benign. What we really worry about more is if it's degenerative Hisperkinchy system um, disease, where, where the AV node or the Hisperkinchy just is not able to conduct electricity. And that tends to be degenerative. It tends to get worse. And so how do you differentiate, you know, kind of a benign bradycardia from a more malignant bradycardia? Well, the first thing is look at the context in which it's happening, okay? So is it happening while the patient is awake or asleep? You know, that's really, you know, key. When people are asleep, as you can imagine, it's natural to be bradycardic. That's a normal thing. What you want, and, and, and that's fine, you know, you don't really need to be fast. What you worry about is if you're in a scenario where someone needs to pick up their heart rate and they can't or they're not. That's the situation where bradycardia is a problem. So we almost never really pay attention to um, sleeping bradycardia. Almost never. It, it really would be unusual. What we pay attention to, first and foremost, is are they awake and are they having symptoms? Second of all, what other clues? Like how about apnea or suction? If it's an intubated patient and they're having apneic episodes or they're being suctioned, that's a strong indication that really you're just transiently enhancing their vagal tone and causing some heart block or causing some pauses. Do we worry about that? No. Vagal tone is not a, uh, an abnormal thing because what we know is if you really need your heart to go faster, all, all the patient does is their body withdraws the vagal tone and they go faster. So if it's happening during sleep, if it's happening during suction, things like that, we generally won't worry so much. Uh, you know, as I said, is, are there other hemodynamic abnormalities? Are they hypotensive and they're not able to maintain the heart rate with, you know, relative to the hypotension? And is there evidence of any other underlying conduction disease? So, for example, if they have a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch block, that shows that they've got some Hisperkinji disease, right? And so if they're having some heart block, well, you know, maybe the whole thing, the whole Hisperkinji system is not working. So if you see something like this, that's more worrisome that maybe the heart block that you're seeing is not so benign. So look at the context in which the heart block is happening um, to help guide you as to whether it's benign or not.
So in terms of management, once you've kind of sorted these things out, what do you do, right? So this is, you know, is a little bit tricky because you have to determine their clinical stability, but it's both current and predicted, right? And, and th these things can change. It's not unusual to have someone with bradycardia or, say, like heart block, and they come in and they're mentating and they're stable and they're fine, and it's like 5 o'clock at night, and you say, okay, they're stable, we don't need to do anything, but sometimes heart block is degenerative and it gets worse, right? And so you've got to try to predict, is this someone that's going to get worse or not? You know, do they have any of those signs that, you know, maybe things are a little bit more malignant, going back to the slide that I was uh, showing you earlier. You know, if you're truly sure that they're stable, you can just watch them on telemetry. But if they're unstable, there's really only one way to, to definitively treat, you know, malignant rhythms, and that's to pace them. If it's truly just sinus bradycardia, you can do things like atropine. That can help. Um, but especially if we're talking about heart block, a malignant degenerative heart block, things like atropine won't work. It can actually make things worse. You're just going to be slamming an AV node even faster that can't conduct. The AV node can't keep up with the sinus rate of 80. You hit them with atropine and make the sinus rate go to 100 and 120, you're just going to be slamming even worse, and it's not going to help things. So the only way to fix that is to pace patients. And how do you pace them? Well, there's two ways. There's transcutaneous or transvenous, right? Each one has its advantages and disadvantages. Transcutaneous patient is quick, you know, pacing is quick and easy. So you just slap the patches on them and off you go. You hit pace. That's the advantage, but the disadvantage is it's not, it's not reliable. You can't always capture reliably, and it's also not very comfortable, as you know, for those of you who have done it to a patient. Um, you know, that's, uh, it, it can be pretty painful to be paced and having the twitching and things like that. But if you're in a bind and you need something you know, quick and easy, then that's a good place to start. Transvenous pacing is much more reliable. On the other hand, the disadvantage is it's invasive and more time-consuming. You've got to get the neckline in, you've got to get the, the pacing catheter through the IJ and into the right ventricle and things like that. And it's, it's just not technically as easy to do. But very doable, and what you often will do is buy some time with transcutaneous until you or someone else that is comfortable um, gets the transvenous wire in place. That's pretty much it. Then we can just finish off quickly by talking about device problems, because it's not that unusual, I'm sure, that you have patients in the ICU that have pacemakers or defibrillators, and questions do come up as to are they working properly or not. A lot of times we get called with you know something like the pacemaker is going haywire. And we'll see something you know like this. So here's an example of a strip that let's just look at what's happening. So there's a QRS there. You got a pacing spike and a P wave, so that's an atrial pacing spike, and then we got a QRS, and then we got another atrial pacing spike and a P wave, and, and there's nothing, and then there's another pacing spike and another pacing spike and a QRS, and then a pacing spike and nothing, and then what the heck is going on? This is like wacko, right? So actually, this is an example of totally normal pacemaker function, and and this is just I'm using this as an example to show this is, what this is, is an algorithm that one of the device companies uses called MVP. It's a way to try to minimize the amount of pacing of the ventricle, and it goes through this pacing algorithm to try to minimize the amount of pacing in the, in the ventricle, because as you may know, that can sometimes be deleterious. The point is, this looks wacky, but it's actually totally normal. And true pacemaker malfunction, where the pacemaker just goes crazy, is actually pretty rare. Most commonly, the device is functioning normally, especially if it's a chronic device. It was implanted a long time ago. The battery life is fine. Pacemakers generally work really well um, and reliably. Um, however, you should be aware that things like lead dislodgements or fractures can happen, and especially if it's a newly implanted device, right? If we just, if we just put a pacemaker in, everything is not totally healed in place, sometimes stuff happens. The lead can dislodge or it can perforate or things like that before everything is endothelialized in place. So occasionally, especially if it's a new, fresh implant, you see something funny, it's never wrong to give us a call and, and check out uh, what's going on. Um, call for us to interrogate the device.
Um, defibrillator problems, you know, lot, lots of patients in the ICU are going to have defibrillators. And so the big thing that I just like to quickly touch on is, you know, what if someone is having recurrent ICD shocks? You know, you've got someone in the ICU, whatever's going on, um, and they're, they're getting shocks from their defibrillator. Well, one of two things is happening. Those shocks are either inappropriate, meaning they're not in VT, there's something else is going on, they're in maybe AFib, rapid AFib, and it's tricking the device into telling the, you know, thinking that it's VT and they're shocking the patient inappropriately, or it's appropriate, meaning the patient's really going into VT and it's shocking them for that. Well, what do you do for these situations? It almost doesn't matter. The first thing that you can do if you're not sure what's going on, regardless, is put a magnet on the device, okay? Uh, most units will have magnets, or if it's not in the ICU, at the very least, it'll definitely be in the CCU or the cath lab. They have just put a magnet over the device. And you guys know what the magnet does? So it's, it's different in pacemakers and defibrillators, okay? If you put a magnet over a pacemaker, it makes it just pace asynchronously, meaning it just paces without any sensing or any changes. It'll just make it do nothing but pace, regardless of the situation. That's a pacemaker. If you put a magnet over a defibrillator, it does not affect the pacing function of the defibrillator. Remember, all defibrillators can act as pacemakers. It won't affect the pacemaker function, but what it does is it just turns off therapies. Okay? So if you have someone getting shocked up the wazoo, put a magnet on, and that will deactivate therapies. Okay? And that's the quickest and easiest way to turn off a defibrillator. Um, and then you can manage each clinical situation accordingly, right? So if the patient is getting inappropriately shocked and they don't need the shocks, well, you've put the magnet on and you fix the problem. You've stopped the shocks, and so you've bought yourself time and you can sort out the rest later. If they're appropriately getting shocked for VT or VF, you can still take, you know, put the magnet on, and then at, at the very least, You've still got, you know, VT to deal with, but you're in control of the situation. You can shock the patient with paddles or patches. You can determine when or, you know, the patient should or should not get shocked. And so, you know, that's still something that it's reasonable pro to put on the magnet so you have control over if and when the patient is getting shocked. Obviously, in these types of situations, you're going to want to get us or, you know, the, the uh, CCU team well, but again, it gives you time so that the patient's not getting shot over and over and over because, you know, VT storm and things like that, patients can get 70, 80, 100 shocks, and it's, you know, we have patients out there that have PTSD from these experiences. It can be pretty, pretty awful, and so if you're up against it, throw a magnet on there, and then you can deal with it, so the magnet is your friend. Um, just to touch up, uh, you know, uh, everything else, you know, once once all those initial things are done, you still need help, obviously, give us a call, and if you're in the middle of the night and something's happening with the device, you can always call the device companies, and each, these are the three main companies uh, that make devices, and you can call them, and they have great technical service that can help you through things if you're, if you're in a bind as well.